evening, members, for our last one of the year. Um, straight away, um, let's get the webcasting introduction out of the way. I would like to remind everyone present that this, is, this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet or filmed and will be capable of repeated viewing or another use by such third parties. If you are seated in the lower public seating area, it is likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. This may infringe your human and data protection rights and if you wish to avoid this, you should move to the upper public gallery. And can I just remind members to turn their microphones off after speaking, please? Apologies, Laura. Apologies have been received from Councillor Bassett, Councillor Morgan and Councillor McCready. Substitute members? Uh, Councillor Janet Whitehouse for Councillor McCready and Councillor Helen Kane for Councillor Morgan. And do we have any declarations of interest, members? I take that as no. Okay, notes of the previous meetings, pages five to eight. Do we agree those notes? Agreed? Thank you. Any matters arising, arising from outstanding actions? Laura? No matters. No? no matters arising. Terms of reference for the work programme, um, as this is the last one and nothing else is actually put forward to um, the new year. Um, I don't think there's anything discussed there, other than Councillor Heap, I did mention yours again at another meeting. And it's on the list. And it's on the list. Right, what's the next one? Sustainable transport, um, pages 13 to 16. Um, over to you, Stephen. Thanks, good evening, members. Uh, Stephen Lloyd-Jones, Sustainable Transport Officer. Um, I'm here this evening to talk about three main areas. Um, this is an environment rapidly changing technology, disruptive introdu introductions to the market on electric vehicles, some funding difficulties and regulatory issues around the bus market, and trying to get the right infrastructure for this district on cycling, um, which is, none of these are easy tasks, but uh, I hope to persuade you that we're, we're trying our best to make, make progress alongside Essex. So starting with the bus market, I think you may well have seen um, headlines in the papers about usage being de uh, massively reduced around the country, unfortunately, with the erosion and changes in people's working patterns. The five-day-a-week commute largely is not the case for large swathes of the population We've still got an element of the more vulnerable still being nervous about travelling. Perhaps some of their behaviours have been uh, changed or dented by the pandemic. Um, so there's a number of things in play here. In the deregulated environment in Essex, uh, we've got this combination of commercial bus services uh, where the operators can make or think they can make a profit as against county council subsidised services which may be just evening routes or, or weekend that the commercial operator doesn't want to take on. Uh, again, relating to the pandemic, but just before, the DART 87, which is the first item I'd like to talk about, was introduced in the light of Arriva ceasing the 87 route and Essex County Council deciding they couldn't fully subsidise that route. So we stepped in as a district, as a a sort of emergency measure in terms of retaining a link between uh, Loughton, Debden, Epping, Epping Upland uh, and onwards into Harlow, including Princess Alexandra. So that was deemed a, a demand responsive transport service, so not operating to a fixed timetable, uh, more fleet of foot in terms of matching demand. We were hoping that Princess Alexandra and St Margaret's staff would have come on to this in numbers during the pandemic and then as people returned to five-day commuting to the station we'd be able to link particularly Harlow residents where we've definitely found that there's a financial uh, need for them to travel by tube rather than 
train. So those are the conditions we were hoping for uh, in the event with all the surrounding difficulties. Uh, certainly financially that service has not washed its face at all, to use that phrase. Uh, but in terms of the sort of social value element for, for those without cars who had to get to the hospital, uh, for those who were working throughout the pandemic and needed tube access, um, I'd argue that it has had an important part to play. So in terms of marketing, which is always crucial, so this is a new type of service, not as well funded as the example I quote here that Essex are running in Braintree and Uttlesford, uh, which is very well funded, multiple vehicles, electric vehicles, fully app controlled. This is operating on a kind of shoestring really. So um, we've tried to move from a pre-booked service. So we're using Epping Forest Community Transport who've done a fantastic job for the, uh, both the NHS and bailing out for want of a better word, Essex doing the height of the pandemic, running scheduled services uh, to meet lower demand but where people still had to travel. So we're using a uh, community transport operator. Initially, that was operating in their traditional dial -a ride type way. So you book in advance by phone or email, probably at least 24 hours in advance. We felt we had to start capturing the younger adult element, perhaps intervene in those car purchase decisions, not knowing actually the cost of living crisis was then going to come along. So we felt we had to introduce an app and we've launched now um, the Community Transport Passenger app, um, which frankly hasn't been without its gremlins. I think we're one of the first operators in the country to adopt it. FlexiRoute is the standard community transport scheduling app for community transport operators. This is the passenger version. So again, with a combination of social media, articles in the housing news, interaction and, and help with, from parishes like Epping Upland that are on the route, We've done our best to promote that. We've had, to the end of December, 123 downloads of the app, whereby you had to select Epping Forest as the, as the area. That's yet to translate into significant extra usage, um, and there was a four-week delay on that, unfortunately. So, again, new technology comes into play there. Um, but just to stress that all markets are covered by this service. So elderly, more vulnerable person can still ring Epping Forest Community Transport and pre-book this. Perhaps a relative can do that on their behalf. But a younger person wanting to get to the tube from Epping Upland or Harlow can, can come in on the app and start to make use of that. So I think really the asks here are, the trial comes to an end at the end of March. Essex are learning a lot more about demand responsive transport, albeit with £2 million of DFT funding for the Uttlesford and Braintree district. So my hope is that they will assist us in terms of keeping the service going under this demand responsive transport term and umbrella, give us a chance to make the app work in practice uh, and continue to support the more vulnerable people with the community transport model. Um, so those, that's the main content in terms of bus. We'd already launched a £2 flat fare ahead of the Department for Transport's £2 fare on all buses outside London. They've extended that to the end of June now, that offering nationally, which just shows the, the problems in the industry. So that's my update on, on the bus and demand responsive transport. I'm happy to take questions now if that's preferred or to move on to electric vehicles. I think Janet has got a question. Councillor Whitehouse. Steve in your microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my question's about the uh, demand responsive transport and the publicity. At the March Council, I think it was a portfolio holder report, mentioned about the publicity for this and it talked about posters and um, parishes doing various things. Councillor Amos is a parish councillor. He hasn't seen any publicity about this and I haven't seen anything around in Faden Boys. I just wonder what sort of posters were going out and, and more about that sort of paper-based publicity. I, I think it's a great scheme but I don't feel I really understand it. And if I had some leaflets, you know, when I'm out talking to people about things, I would promote it and hand out the leaflets. But, you know, the people I'm interacting with are more leaflet-based than looking on, you know, online. Um, 
Well, I've certainly been round to the parishes. Epping Upland have definitely put the posters up. Thaden Boys have, and we did deliver. So we had a print run of uh, a, a pamphlet. So, as you say, sometimes it's a very wide sea to cast your net into. But I assure you, it, it is out there. But any other support from members to to get it out within a parish environment or localised environment, we have a stock of those leaflets there for that audience. I'm happy to, to send you some, bring you some. Uh, Loughton Town Council definitely have put the, the posters up on, on their notice boards as well. So we need to do more, but we've, we've, we've tried so far with all the things at our disposal. Thank you. I will look more carefully in Satan Boys and see if I can find them. Councillor Heap. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can see what you're doing is great, and, but I don't think there's enough of it. That's the problem. And that's not your fault. It's a policy decision. Because um, if you're in Bucker Still and you're slightly elderly, or just unfit, you can't get from the bottom of the hill up to the top. So there needs to be some kind of looping bus system that goes right throughout Buckerstill. Same with Loughton, same with just about all of the places that are, are in the district. And it has to be put in place before people can use it, because there is a distrust about bus services. Uh, if you live in the bottom of uh, Buckerstill and Buckerstill East, the 571 TFL service moved from 45 minutes to an hour to 70 minutes. And when it gets to 70 minutes, you know that they're trying to close it down because you don't know which 10 minutes past the hour you've actually missed it by. So you could be there for um, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, so there needs to be much, much more of it for people to start using it. Indeed, the, the backdrop, as I've said, is even TfL cutting their cloth accordingly. But the more we learn about this DRT model combined especially with the community transport, then the more chance we've got. So the DigiGo example had £2 million funding. It's got, I think, seven or eight vehicles covering a rural area. So perhaps there's a bid in the offing for a more urbanised version of that. So I'm in close contact all the time with Essex colleagues who are keen to work out different scenarios where DRT can work. And that one could be a matter of literally coming to your doorstep potentially, uh, which at the moment we've not been able to deploy with Dart 87. But thank you, bids I think are, DFT is very interested in solving these thorny issues. Councillor Kane, I believe you have a question. Yes, I do. Um, okay, well, uh, let's go to different wards then. <laughs> let's go to different town. Let's go to Waltham Abbey. And uh, we can see we have a lot of vulnerable people there and we have a lot of youngsters who actually to, would like to go to school, to, to colleges in Harlow and things like that. I find it very, very difficult. Uh, is there any scope at all? Because I'm worried that if that trial finishes in March, how are you going to extend to other towns as well? If you could explain that. Thanks. Um, there's no getting away from the fact that, you know, as I've said, throughout the country, all routes are under scrutiny. Essex will have a scoring system to say what areas does it visit, who does it support. That's in terms of the routes they're prepared to subsidise. Some of the routes in Waltham Abbey, the ones run by Vectair, are commercial. They're a new entrant operator. I'm not comparing them necessarily with First or Arriva, but they've taken the trouble to come into this area uh, and some of their routes are commercial, some are subsidised. I'm not sure of the route that goes to the college in Harlow, that's an Arriva one, I think. I, I, again, I'm not sure whether, actually whether that's commercial or subsidised, but um, yeah, we need to keep a careful eye on all of these routes and methods. Councillor Allgood. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm very perplexed because the district talks about trying to encourage uh, reducing congestion, encouraging uh, use of cycling, encouraging use of public transport, and yet here we are basically sort of saying if, enough, if not enough people use it, it's probably not going to happen. Surely, I, I, I'm going to sort of say it doesn't matter about the cost because we effectively sort of are giving up and not giving people the opportunity. If you're not giving the people the opportunity, it's never going to happen. So just by saying there's not enough people will withdraw it, which is obviously what the commercial lot do, 
I think us as a district, we're obliged to actually provide a service where other people are not. And I know there's a cost implication to it, but we really are just... <laughs> I find it very difficult to say to people, yeah, use more buses, use more buses, but there are no buses. Uh, and I don't think we're doing enough to actually sort of put them on the... To make people use them in the first place. If, we're not, if they're not going to be reliable, if they're not consistent enough, we'll... We're fighting a battle here. The commercial world aren't going to do it, so somebody needs to pick that up. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is the reality of the deregulated environment. I haven't yet mentioned the local plan. Now, obviously, that will put funding into buses that will support existing communities as well as uh, the new entrance to the market. So, so that is there. Uh, as I've said, I think you're right. We have to find a solution working with operators in Essex, bidding for funding, supporting those operators that are interested in our area and showing willing. We need to do what we can to promote things. I mean, the two pound fare, I'm not sure who is aware of that at a national level here. Uh, we need national help as well as uh, from Essex and, and, and the operators. So, um, well, I'm here to do a job in whatever time's left, I'll, I'll commit to say that we will try as many things as we can to solve localised and, and, and niche problems as well as the core routes. As I've said, the 420 is a, is a viable commercial service which, um, you know, it, there are viable routes in this area, but we need to bring the others up to speed by whatever means we can. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Heather, I think you've got a question. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I really don't know the first thing about buses, apart from they're big red and get in the way, but I used to live in London. Um, demand responsive. So if I go to a bus stop, does this bus run a prescribed route backwards and forwards all day long? And do I go to a bus stop, stand there, and it will turn up, or do I need to book it, phone it, or, and then stand there and wait the hour for it to get there? Or does it only run if it's got enough people to go along that line? Thanks. So there's different variants of demand responsive. What we were hoping and may still happen is that enough people would have a demand, let's say, for a shift time start at Princess Alexandra Hospital and then others coming back the other way wanting to reach the tube. And you aggregate all the interest from the app or calls and the software can begin to say to people, We've got four other people wanting to go back to the Epping Tube. If you arrive 10 minutes later, it's all pre-booked, by the way, so at least 24 hours in advance. Some models where there's very full funding, multiple vehicles can cover an area, which is what they are doing and trialling in Braintree and Uttlesford, then you're much more able to say, in 20 minutes' time, I want to travel. At the moment, because of the maximum two vehicles, uh, A, we are running on a corridor-type route, and B, you have to book it in advance. But there are models out there being trialled with funding that, that can deliver what you just described almost. Councillor Helen Kane. Yeah, from what I hear, Chairman, you know, of the members here, it, it is obvious that what we need to do is perhaps uh, have more uh, cooperation with the Paris councils. Uh, because uh, we are people that, you know, if we had a, a Zoom meeting with participation of town councillors, then we can actually, you know, we do surgeries, we do meet people, we can, as uh, councillor of uh, White Houses, we can promote this uh, scheme and we can bring a lot more because, you know, we understand that you can actually be in many places, but not uh, all the time. And we can actually help on that a lot, provided we have the opportunity, we have the information to hand. Because to be honest with you, uh, the, the generation that it is, you know, the 50 plus generation, it's very difficult with that kind of roads that we have to start cycling and to go anywhere. I'm sorry about this, but that's the reality. Thanks. And indeed, within the last two weeks, there was a parish call, a hybrid meeting in the end. So in the end, I think we had three or four parishes in attendance, again, on the community transport, DRT, how could we help promote it? Um, it wasn't a full, full meeting in terms of attendance, but again, 
we can reconvene those. We, we did have an attempt at that two weeks ago. Um, so yes, all the localised help we, is very much welcome. Do you want to come back, Helen? Just very clear. We have a local liaison group here, and uh, that is where all the parishes are come. And uh, we have a, it is an excellent meeting, and perhaps, uh, yeah, that will be the the, the best uh, That's the end place. Of this month, isn't it? Yes, it is actually. Councillor Sam Kane. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is almost an intractable problem. Here at district and at parish level, all we can do is look for sticky plaster kind of solutions, which is what the DART 87 is. It's a good experiment. We need to find out if it would work. But to get the depth of cover and the depth of service um, to prize people out of their cars and onto public transport needs a massive governmental injection of cash. It, it, it's not going to be done at district. It's not going to be done at county. The, the problems we have across Essex are further compounded in as much as the Essex is, is responsible, if you like, for, in terms of bus services, getting kids to school uh, and subsidising where it can uh, critical bus routes. It's not a great way of building a public transport system. It's got to come down from government. Essex is also not a transport authority, like we have the London Transport Authority, so they can't raise um, funds specifically for transport. It's all part of the, 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 the main budget and it's all fighting for money for antisocial, uh, for uh, social care, for education. It's all part of the pot. We do need an Essex Transport Authority. We do need governmental funding. Until that happens, we are just looking at sticking plaster solutions. Now, the great sticking plaster is a really good one, the Dart 87, but without the depth of service that's requ required, or the depth of cover that's required to make it a, a, a viable alternative for the, uh, the inveterate car user, we're not going to get people out of their cars. And this is the end, at the end of the day, this is the argument that we're trying to, to avoid all the congestion, to avoid all the parking problems. We need a proper public transport system. In London, I don't know what the percentages are, Stephen probably does, but young people under 35 just don't own vehicles. Many of them don't even know how to drive mm. because they rely on public transport. It's the way they were growing up. Out here in, in the relative sticks and further out in real rural lands, you have to drive, and you have to drive as soon as you're 17. Otherwise, you're going nowhere, uh, and that's, that's the way it is. So it needs a complete rethink from government, spreading down through county into district to get that depth of cover for a real public transport system that can make a difference. Until such time, I have to say, we're swimming against the tide. Sorry. If I may just add on that, um, I think there's definite signs the government are realising the scale of this. So there's also an entity called Transport East, which is a sub-national transport authority, which potentially has bigger ability to get very large funding out of Department for Transport. They're emerging. I don't know how aware people are of, of that, but that's, that's another route, I think, which can tap into, I have to put the case for Essex, um, and in, in their case, the wider East. But... Um, I think that's a reflection of the task and the need for focus and, and central government support. I think we've talked about that bit long enough. I think there's been some good points come up there, especially from Sam at the end there, and again, Helen's point of um, local liaison, because you've got all the councils here in this chamber at the time, so I think that might be a good way of doing some form of presentation to them. I think it's a problem that you're never going to solve because we're a rural area at the end of the day and people live, I'm going to say, miles apart, basically. But shall we move on to the second part, which I think is electric vehicles, isn't it? Thanks very much. Just because it's electric, I'll just remind everyone, have a look at the Digigo website uh, for Braintree and Uttlesford. They're electric minibuses as well as some of the other things we've mentioned. Uh, I'll try and 
avoid too many acronyms in this one, but it's a bit <laughs> unavoidable with uh, technology. So electric vehicles are here. Um, historically, it was the better off with off-street parking, potentially people in higher paid jobs with benefits in kind and company car side, but now we are emerging into a much more familiar site on the roads. Um, and in terms of a district comparison, there are more battery-only electric vehicles on the roads of Epping Forest, owned by our residents and businesses, than any other district in Essex. So it's been embraced by businesses to some extent. Um, however, as the paper suggests, there are certain things that could pose a barrier and a limit on those perhaps who are uncertain about whether it's for them. Uh, I heard the discussions at a previous meeting about uh, public charging around Christmas time, which was a bit of an extreme case, but it does illustrate people's concerns about their ability to charge in public. So the good news is in terms of our own activity, our own assets, the uh, Instavolt rapid chargers have been of significant success, used immediately at a high level. Instavolt are pleased with the performance. It's been a win-win for us in terms of extra parking revenue. We've met an urgent need, especially for the higher mileage driver, whether that be business or someone on a longer road trip, perhaps on business matters. That comes at a cost. Those are premium charges, which are expensive, not, despite what you might read in the press, as expensive as running a petrol car or diesel if you've got other charging methodology at home or at your workplace. There are limits on what we can do, so again, Essex have to come into play on this. There's some more charges about to go live in Ongar at Banson's Lane, um, and I will guarantee you will not see those empty. You will not see all four of those empty. They will be used from day one. I was up at Ongar Business Centre in advance of this. They've got 15 battery electric or plug-in hybrid users amongst their tenant group, and they are champing at them for this. So the public will see heavy use, um, and we will benefit in terms of the factors I described on meeting our zero emission targets and, and, and air quality targets. That's not enough, though, so we need neighbourhood charging, uh, perhaps for the more self-employed element, van-based people in council estates and with no off-street parking. Um, there is progress being made with Essex on that. There's been pan-district meetings where almost as one, the districts are saying we have to have on-street charging. At the moment, there's none in our district at all and very little around the rest of the county. Compare and contrast with even outer London boroughs where there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, charging points of different speeds, particularly the overnight ones, which we're very much lacking. So there is pressure on Essex. A debate is going on. They obviously don't want to just convert every petrol or diesel car to electric. That doesn't solve the issue of congestion uh, and the other definite benefits of public transport and cycling. Uh, but there is, pro there is progress being made. As far as what's going on in the multi-storey, that's another early sort of win in terms of additional charges. I mean, taking Epping as, as an example, the Tesco pod point charges were the first in this town, and that was only late last year. We've got areas like Buckhurst Hill with no public charging still, Chigwell with none, not enough in Loughton, not enough in Waltham Abbey. So between us as a district and our assets, the private sector, again, we're facilitating and, and approving everything we can in terms of People like Waitrose and Buckhurst Hill putting charges in. There's quite a few of those coming through. Um, and then lobbying Essex on the on-street side of things. Again, I think there's central government pressure on county councils to do more. There's limits to what we can do. All I'll say is uh, that pressure on Essex exists, and I believe there will be some movement on that. So at the moment, Essex is way behind the All England average, as are we as a district, around half the run rate in terms of public charges per 100,000 population. My prediction is between what we can do, the private sector things we know about, and certain other opportunities like Collis multi-storey, we will at least match the All England average by the end of this calendar year and overtake various districts. Uh, we won't overtake Braintree because they put 40 charges in at Gridserve, but uh, 
that again is worth a visit. It's a concept which could potentially work in certain areas here, but the main thing is get some on-street charges in to accommodate the people without off on street uh, without off-street parking. Um, I think that's probably the main thing there. I think we stand out as a district. We're close to the current A406 ULES, let alone the extended one. Uh, we've got plenty of incentives for our residents to to get that, and that many of them are voting with their feet and adopting ahead of other districts. One figure that stands out for me is that pure battery is, is pulling ahead of plug-in hybrid in this district in ways that isn't happening elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, I think we have to build on the interest residents and local businesses have had and facilitate as much as possible a range of other charging types uh, to help those who pr probably need it most in terms of lack of off-street parking. Thank you. That's the main update. If, uh, any questions? I think Councillor Brady. Um, is this the moment to ask about cycling, or are you telling us something about cycling in a That's minute? That's going to be the next. Or, oh, well, I'll ask my cycling question. <laughs> Anybody got anything on charging points? Councillor Allgood? I'm obviously fairly new to all of this, so I always keep getting surprised that we seem to be caught with our pants down all the time and we are effectively waiting for it to go wrong and then we try and fix it. So how did we get so far behind all the other national uh, counties or districts and so, so on? Again, this is an area the government is trying to seed fund. So there was very large scale funding for county councils uh, for on-street charging and, and off-street charging in car parks. Uh, Essex have not been successful in two rounds of that major funding Hence, we've got areas like West Sussex and, and other comparable county councils who are way, way ahead of us. So um, perhaps under-ambitious in, in the bids for those things, I don't know. But um, there are now new players, very well-funded uh, joint private and public entities, um, which are out there installing in large numbers. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's the explanation I would give. Councillor Heath. Thank you. Yep, you're doing all you can, and that's very good. Uh, there is a bigger problem, and that's probably an Essex problem, in that um, there are lots of people in more built-up areas who can't park on their forecourts because they are that much short of the magic five-metre mark. So there needs to be a relaxation on that. And people I know in Buckerstill East are willing to sign covenants on their house to say that only a small car can be used on the front. But that's the only way, ultimately, you're going to get people to go onto electric cars big time. Because if you have a street with you know, 20 houses and they're split into two, then there's 40 people needing to charge their cars. It's not going to happen. Thank you. Um, I think in outer London boroughs, it's a swamp of the area with street lamp chargers. Therefore, OK, you may not be able to get that space outside your own home. There are other methodologies like pavement channeling. For the, I think that's the scenario you're talking about, which Essex are looking at. Um, but outer London, inner London, is, that problem doesn't exist. The, the street lamps are the route, in my opinion, to that mass neighbourhood overnight charging. Uh, I'm not ruling that out. That may still happen in Essex sometime fairly soon, uh, but their position needs to be sort of revised somewhat. Otherwise, drop curbs obviously are a planning consideration. I, I can check what rules there are if you promise to park a smart car rather than a Range Rover on your front drive. That's, that, that may be something to look at. Uh, and by the way, we definitely want to support people in the council estates and flats as well. Plenty of examples, motability users getting EVs, van drivers being told that the company is switching to EV will fund a charger for your home. Uh, I live in a flat. So we definitely need to support all tiers of, of the community. Councillor Heather. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't really know about the ones in the car parks and bits and pieces like that, but if, if a, a homeowner wanted to install an electric vehicle charger and their cutout, main cutout fuse was less than 100 amps, they could ask the DNO quite nicely, would you come and up rate my main fuse? That's not a major problem, pull one out and put one in. 
The infrastructure, the electricity inf infrastructure, is still old and creaking. Who pays for the other stuff to be upgraded so that we can have all these installed things? I mean, uh, to my knowledge, a street light runs on single phase 230 supply, probably with a 2.5 mil cable in it, so mm. it's not going to support a seven kilowatt charger. Indeed not. So I, I think a lot of the London street lamp chargers are definitely overnight charging at three kilowatts or, or sub that. Um, I don't know the technicalities of home, but it's an important point that we've got at least a third of households have got no off street parking. And in addition to that, there may be other issues like that where it's not suitable or there's too many cars in, in, in the driveway. So you cannot ignore the fact that the perhaps 40% of people are not going to get off street parking anytime soon. So, um, yeah, very important. Councillor Brady. Yes, on that note, I'm a country bumpkin, I suppose, out here. And I went and stayed the night last Saturday with a friend in South London. <clears throat> and that was the big difference, um, was all the cars charging up overnight. So in the streets, some from lampposts, some from all the installed things all the way along, vast amounts of it. And I was amazed because obviously it's been a few years since I've wandered around the streets of London or something. So it does happen, it will happen, and it is happening in some areas. And it was both varieties, it was all different sorts, so that interested me. Thanks. And by the way, that's a good reminder that we are not leaving rural matters out of that. The, um, the Rural Economic Development Fund, we, we've got something earmarked there to work perhaps with the village halls uh, to look at their insulation, energy generation and potentially EV charging. Again, not the most lavish sort. And by the way, the likes of Instavolt deal with all of that. It's a, it's a concessionary contract. They deal with UK power networks. They sort out the access. If a new substation is needed, they will even fund that. But again, that's industrial, professional scale as opposed to homeowners. Sorry, excuse me, everybody. Being late. Well, thank you again on that section. I think you've got one other section to do, haven't you? Cycling. <laughs> oh, sorry, Councillor Kane. Sam? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to add to what's been said. Um, Councillor Heather hit the nail bang on the head. It is the infrastructure that is the biggest hold up here. Um, street lights won't support them. The, the current street lights, or the majority of the street lights across Essex won't support um, chargers. Um, you can only imagine the necessary works to dig new channels to put in dedicated power stations, uh, power charging points. Um, we have a local one in Waltham Abbey. We've been fighting to get a block of Instavolt installed in there. Uh, Instavolt are keen to get them in. It's good business for them. It's good business for us. Uh, and UK Power Networks just haven't got the infrastructure in place to support it. And it, they're prevaricating and pushing back and all the rest of it. At the end of the day, they're going to have to put in a substation to run it. Uh, and it's these kind of problems. It's not a question of popping down to Nissan, buying a, 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 a note and plugging it in when you get home. There's a whole bunch of problems mm. associated with it. Um, and there's no quick solutions, and it's that wonderful word, money, that uh, is required. Thanks. Uh, it's all about horses for courses, if I may interject there. So Instable are after a particular audience who are prepared to pay a premium price. Um, I'm talking about the wider range. There's medium, slow, fast, super fast, ultra fast, is mm. what Instable's stock in trade is. So. They reviewed our car parks, and you're definitely right, some of them are not capable. Some of them are capable for a mid-range charger, some have barely got an electricity supply, so, um, but it's horses for courses, we need to meet all needs. All right, thank you, Sam. Again, you summed it up quite nicely. <laughs> um, cycling, Stephen. Right, thank you. Again, this contains more uh, county council content, so uh, here we go. Um, well, with the local plan being adopted, of course, that's, that's the first thing I'd say. Within developments and potentially linking developments to other settlements, that's a good step forward. The way these things work, um, including with central government, we now have Active Travel England as a mandatory sort of body to consult on planning applications. Again, it's another area where the government is showing its commitment in terms of active travel. Um, so within 
the new developments as they emerge and linking, there's that opportunity there. Other than that, for now, it's all predicated on us having local cycling, walking infrastructure plans, LC WIPs, as they're called in the industry. So if you have one of those, it's a formal assessment of the roots and the needs of a community, what it can link to, employment sites, other segregated routes. The good news is we have funded one for Waltham Abbey on the basis that Essex are supporting anything that gets more deprived communities into active travel. There are wards in Waltham Abbey where I think 50% of households at least do not have access to a car. And yet just to the west, you've got the north-south Lee Valley route um, and then onward routes into Enfield Employment and Broxbourne, except that the east of Waltham Abbey is actually quite a distance. Um, so the LC WIP is a formal assessment of the town's network and ideas to create routes to support that kind of employment, access to education and leisure and well-being routes, which are tantalisingly just on the doorstep of Waltham Abbey. So that one's in frame, that's funded, um, we'll kick that off this year. The less good news is that Essex have a pipeline of other districts have already done these, so we would have to lobby to get ours into their pipeline to be completed by 2030. As I've said, we've got local plan development, Section 106 type funding now likely. Um, so at the moment, it's have a plan, design a network, starting with Waltham Abbey. I'm in constant contact with people like Epping Forest Transport Action Group who are intense cycling lobbyists. They've got a lot of London connections and they know how to get things done. So we'll listen to all interested groups. LC Whip, by the way, was also done within Harlow for Harlow Gilston Garden Town. So there's two in the frame that will definitely get us somewhere in Essex's pipeline for construction. Um, implementation of infrastructure is key. There will definitely be behaviour change things that can work, provided you have some infrastructure. Um, so I think the focus needs to be a recognition that cycling conditions for those who are less confident is, are pretty difficult in this mm -hmm. district. Um, but Waltham Abbey will be the, the first area where we try to define something that is suitable for all levels of cycling and uh, access to all the services and, and things that people need. Stephen, one of the points that somebody mentioned to me was secure parking for bikes. Where do you actually put them? If you want to go on the train, if you come into Epping or Ongar or whatever. Good point. Certainly Epping Station doesn't have much. No. Um, some of the railheads are, 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 are better. Uh, I know in some of our council housing areas, we've got the sort of clamshell type thing for residents because storing bikes within corridors is, is, is a no-no. Um, but yes, that's a good point. Again, Network Rail, we're insisting on stations having travel plans. So places like Bishop Stortford and St Albans especially has hundreds of cycling storage points. I would need to do an audit of the other stations. Mm. Epping is definitely substandard, um, as I believe the other central line stations mm. are. So I'll take that on board. I've got an ongoing reasonable relationship now with TFL on a range of matters. Mm. Um, so I'll certainly take that What about that coming on. into town itself, if you come into Epping or Ongar? Uh, in terms of segregated routes or? Well, no, no. Oh, where, if you've actually got here, where can you put your bike? <laughs> yeah. Good point. I know there is some Sheffield stands now on Epping High Street. Um, I would imagine the new, well, the new developments will all have to have a quota of both electric vehicle charging points and secure cycle storage for new developments. Mm. But I guess you're talking about existing communities. So yes. um, I think the learning in Epping is interesting in terms of that was pandemic funded, wasn't it? The taking away of some of the car parking mm. spaces to widen the pavements. So. Um, that facilitated some more on-street bays there. We've certainly looked at Debden Broadway. Some of that is a bit substandard and out of the way, and I think there are some plans ongoing to improve the, the cycle parking there. But thanks for the point. Members, I think Councillor Brady had a question. Well, it's more than a question. It's just that I am a cyclist, and I would say... It's absolutely terrible. The lack of facilities, the lack of safe cycling in this area is absolutely disgraceful. We have so many cars, so many vehicles, 
So I'm a horse rider on the roads and a cyclist on the roads, and it is terrifying, and we need safe off-road routes. So we do stuff like we go on holidays, we take our bikes with us, and we cycle everywhere, and other areas have dedicated cycle lanes, and we select holidays to go on where you can just leave the vehicle and cycle for miles. They're the ones we choose. And to my mind, it's so easy to make some simple route through here. Talk to the Corporation of London and all the main arteries that we have between North Weald and Epping and Epping and Loughton, Loughton and Thaden Boys. I mean, you've got a footpath of sorts that runs between Epping and... Loughton and so on. You've got a footpath of sorts all the way down. It just needs what I know it costs money, so it needs widening and it needs flattening out a little, but it's really not rocket science. And when I was young, when there was less traffic around, loads of cyclists used what we call the Epping New Road in those days, which is, I don't know, the B whatever it might call itself now. Um, but nowadays there's so few cyclists because it is so, you know, I've been hit on my horses twice by vehicles in the last three years and it's just so dodgy, so dangerous. We want to cycle to Epping Station all the time and then go places from Epping, but because we're country roads, it's very dodgy. Um, but, I mean, you could eat so easily from where the new houses are going to be in the south of Epping, you've got the pavements, both sides of the road, going all the way up to the station. You could so easily have a walking, cycling one on one side, because the road itself probably isn't wide enough to encompass um, a cycle lane, and then just walkers on the other side. Um, it's not, you know, it's got to be flattened out a bit. It does involve a bit of money. But you get so many less vehicles, so many vehicles will come off the road, you get a fitter population, you get people in, you know, in, in, in better condition that are used to cycling around. As a child, my sister and I cycled around all the roads, and I bet there's not many children where the parents let them out these days. But the safe off road facilities have to come first. They can follow the roads, but they, we don't really want to be exactly at grade with no protection at all. But I would beg you and plead you for the sake of the youngsters in our district. And as for this idea here, um, oh, it'd be great. The existing settlements can use a combination of byways and bridleways to get around on. Well, well, it's obviously only in daylight hours. And I mean, you know, most of the bridleways are mud in the winter. How can you cycle a bike along a load of mud across fields and stuff? That's just a cheap, e that's a get out, I'm afraid. There's a couple of byways where you could do it, but not many. But please, they will be used. They would be used by us, by me, by lots of people that I know. And I know it costs money, but it's like get together with the corporation, see if they'll let you widen out all those pavements, make them fit for cyclists, you will be inundated. And then all the cyclists can get to Epping Forest and can ride around the tracks then without, you know, cars all piling in. Please, thank you. Yes, I don't disagree with a single word you said. And by the way, you brought up Equestrian. I went to a British Horse Society meeting at Thaden Boyce Parrot Village Hall there. And, and yes shocking conditions for, for them as well as cyclists. Obviously, we speak to Corporation of London a lot. We've got shared objectives in terms of sustainable modes of getting to the forest rather than sticking a mountain bike on the back of your car, all those good things. There are other considerations, say lack of safe crossing points where you are on one of those north-south trails and then you have to cross by Wake Arms. There are Essex Highways considerations on what that means, what that costs. So yes, in principle, a lot of these things appear reachable, um, but we will keep going with, with the corporation and um, Essex Highways and uh, again, do what we can. I mean, I, I would actually say on the, on the basis of the byways, something like the Coal Green Way in Hartford linking Wellin and uh, onwards to St Albans, former rail track bed, that has become, albeit the lighting issue, quite a viable shared use route into between towns and through rural areas so that's the reason I put that example in I accept it may not be 100% suitable but 
Yeah, we'll, we'll keep going on this one. I mean, I was referring to the byways in this district, not some byway in Hartford. But yes, I mean, other areas have done that. I mean, they've got wonderful cross-country route between Cambridge and somewhere west of Cambridge, again, that they use for um, buses, but they go. the buses are not normal buses, are they? They go on a concrete route and the bus driver just takes his hands off and sits there until they get to the other end. And that you're allowed horses and bike, you know, we've cycled the whole thing. But it's jolly boring and tedious, but we have cycled it all, and, you allow, and it allows horses as well. So, yeah, shared routes, I feel, are the way forward. Thank you. I mean, obviously, the early wins in this area will be Harlow Gilston in terms of the sustainable transport corridors, which will be along the lines of what you described. But, yes, fully accept the rest of this district is not in that state. Well, Harlow was designed with that in mind, wasn't it? I mean, it was designed in order to be able to access everywhere on bikes to start off with. We've got, an old, we've got older infrastructure here, but so is the rest of the country, and they can manage to do it in lots of places. So with a lot of thought and a bit of money, so can we. Thank you, Councillor Brady. Um, again, it seems to come down to superstructure, doesn't it? <laughs> seems to be the common word through all three here at the moment. Um, Councillor Heather. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and to assist my fellow councillor, it's Trumpington, I think you're thinking of, and they're called yes. guided buses. Uh, also, the point that you raised about bridle paths being used by cyclists, my daughter rides a horse through the forest, and the majority of riders are not impressed with people on mountain bikes that are spooking horses and having quite a few riders off. And given that they pay a license to the corporation to allow them to use the bridle paths on a horse, somebody on a bike doesn't, and that's something else that they're not particularly enamoured by. Good point. I think that sort of winds that one up. And, oh, Councillor All Good, sorry. Yeah, sorry, very quickly on that. If we're going to build the places for where the bikes are parked and things like that, isn't it a case of let's build them now rather than waiting so at least people will start getting in the habit because at the moment we're just waiting for it to happen rather than saying let's let's start ball rolling now and encourage people i mentioned the Effie, the sheffield stands in epping high street I, I, I will do an audit of the other high street and high road type of libraries etc uh, and come back to you on that i think that's a worthwhile exercise thank you sounds like the chicken and egg to me <laughs> Well, thank you, Stephen. I think that was a good discussion. I think you've got some points to take away. Um, the next item on the agenda is the North Weald Airfield Development, pages 17 to 30. And we have Darren here to talk you through it. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, members. My name's Darren Goody. I'm the Service Manager Commercial and the Accountable Manager at North Weald Airfield. So the Northfield um, Airfield Master Plan, the proposed development of the eastern side of the aerodrome, will dictate a change to how future aviation operations are performed due to the requirement to relocate the control tower uh, building function, the likelihood of the need for a new entrance and the alternative locations for operational buildings, such as the gatehouse and the fire station. So these changes have presented an opportunity to examine the potential for the airfield to achieve civil aviation uh, licensing standards and to develop aviation further. Ultimately, the report recommends that Northfield remains unlicensed whilst developing the aviation operation by improving facilities, safety, security and attracting new business opportunities. The report has two distinct parts. Section 1 focuses on the licensing's feasibility. When we talk about licensing, we're talking about the, the ability to operate commercial passenger flights. And section two examines the development options. So in terms of the licensing feasibility, uh, a review was carried out by uh, a consultant that looked at the current operation against the Civil Aviation Authority licensing requirements defined within the Civil Aviation Publication 168, licensing aerodromes. The outcome of this uh, part of the report was that achieving licensing standards would be challenging for a number of reasons. And these included um, the, compl the complex airspace issues around the airfield due to the close proximity of Stansted Airport. 
Our ceiling height is 1,500 feet. Uh, Stancid operates at 2,500, so as you can imagine, it's a, it's, it's, it can be quite uh, challenging. Um, the condition of the runway and its limited weight-bearing capability. Um, the runway hasn't had any kind of rehabilitation at work undertaken probably since its inception in, in, the, in the 50s. Um, and basically, we maintain the runway on a, on a budget of around £60,000 a year. The lack of, uh, sorry, the, the level of conflict that currently exists between public vehicles and aircraft. Um, we have a situation at the airfield that I don't think is unique, but we have members of the public in vehicles using the same perimeter road as aircraft, which from a licensing point of view, this is isn't acceptable. What would also be uh, an issue for a fixed based operator to operate commercial flights would be the limited operating times we currently have at the airfield. We currently operate until uh, 1900, 7 o'clock uh, in the summer and we close at sunset um, plus 30 during the winter, which could mean we close at 4 o'clock. Um, the lack of nighttime flying capability, uh, a fixed based operator would want us to have aeronautical lighting so that they could operate at night, up, probably up to about 11 o'clock at night. So in terms of the aviation development, the report identifies a number of options in terms of facilities that would make the airfield a more attractive and safer place to operate on the understanding that it would remain unlicensed. So these things included the rehabilitation of the runway, um, installing aeronautical ground lighting. We were looking at solar lighting. It's on a simple approach lighting system within the boundaries of the airfield and plus navigational aids. The report also considers a new land side, air side boundary fence that would solve the issue of vehicle aircraft conflict. However, that would isolate a number of businesses on the airfield who would no doubt challenge any decision to implement separation on the basis that the leases include access rights. To summarise, the recommendations that the airfield remains unlicensed therefore does not become a, a hub for commercial flight operations, which I believe is something the local population, population would not want to see. Options for developing aviation have been presented that would make the airfield an attractive proposition for aviation related business to locate to. I'm happy to try and answer your questions. Thank you. Councillor Hay. Uh, yeah, it's not really a question. Um, and thank you for the report. It's, uh, it's very comprehensive. I'm just astonished that it was actually given any time at all as an idea to uh, increase aircraft traffic over there. When we think about where we are, we're in Epping Forest. And it's triangulated by the North Circular, the M25 and the M11. Whichever way the wind blows, it's going to get hammered. And when there's no wind, it's going to get the London plume. It's just going to roll over it because of heat generated in London pushing it out. The very last thing we could ever possibly want is increased air traffic going to North Weald. It's a bonkers idea. It should never be seriously considered, uh, but I do take the recommendation. I totally understand where you're coming from. I think the report does mention that we uh, wouldn't necessarily be looking to increase the number of movements. I think the, the kind of development of aviation would be the kind of trying to attract more business, uh, business um, aviation relation businesses over there, whether that be uh, aircraft maintenance, whether that be avionics not necessarily trying to increase the number of movements that we currently have, Councillor. Councillor Kane, Helen. Thank you. Uh, I understand that the tower is actually in the wrong place at the moment, uh, but what are the plans then? Yes, the, the tower in its current uh, location is, is, is in the employment land identified within the master plan. So we are looking at alternative locations to place um, the control tower. And there's, there currently there's a piece of work going on right now to, to identify an area. So yes, we are looking to relocate the control tower function. But the tower stays where it is because you're quite right, it's a grade two listed building. Councillor Whitehouse. Thank you. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about this issue of the public and the planes being together. It would be helpful if you could have a map for those of us who are not quite so familiar with the um, airfield to know where the bits and pieces are. But um, what sort of warning do the public who are going down there, I have driven down there before, 
um, have that you know a plane might be coming. Just talk about the general sort of situation, if you would, please. Not a problem. Um, the issue has been around for around or since the airfield inception, where we've got one particular business that has operated a cafe for 30, 35 years, and it has a lot of visitors. Um, so to mitigate those issues of aircraft, uh, the, the public coming to contact with aircraft on the taxiway, there's a number of things that we do. First of all, we, we try and brief as many people as we possibly can as they enter the airfield. They're given a map, they're given a briefing as to where they, where they need to go, what the rules are in terms of driving speed, give way to aircraft, hazard warning lights, etc. There's also um, a sign as you enter the aviation side of the airfield uh, that actually identifies those driving rules and explains to members of the public that they are in an aviation zone and need to take care. Um, further mitigation actions we're taking is um, we're trying to remove as much of as, as many of the aircraft off the perimeter road as we possibly can and we're taking great strides in doing that by implementing a, uh, a new taxiway that will take around 70% of the aircraft off of the perimeter road and straight onto the runway. We're using a, a ground reinforcement system from uh, what we call the Hangar 2 uh, apron straight to the runway. So that will reduce the, the risk of that conflict enormously. And Councillor Brady. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I have to disagree with Councillor Heap. We live sort of, I don't know, a few miles from the runway, and I absolutely love all the light, all the aircraft. Absolutely love them. The only horrid ones are the jets, obviously, and you limit their flying time enormously, don't you? Because they're raucous and horrible. But all the historic planes that go up from there, and all the you know they fly together in the summer, and it's just wonderful. And I mean, Northfield has a tremendous history for aviation there, and I think it would be very, very sad to lose that. And I'd be very happy to see increased aviation. I think over all the years we've done, taken lots of polls and asked people in the area, and most people have all said that they do want it to continue. Like myself, we like the quiet, smaller ones, and, and you have limited the jets enormously to what they're allowed to do. So on the provision that you wouldn't be having screaming, noisy jets coming in, which really are horrid, um, I think it would be a tremendous shame to lose this aviation, and all it would be turned into is a gigantic industrial estate, I'm afraid, instead, probably wouldn't it, or a huge housing estate and, light and industri heavy industrial, probably. So, um, actually, you know, I know people that work there on the historic planes, and actually I really, we really enjoy seeing them going up. Um, do I, a question now, do I understand that the police no longer use the air? For, could you just fill us in on what's happened with all the police helicopters, please? The National Police Aviation Service still operate from North Weald. What's happened is that the aircraft that uh, service the city have moved back to Lippitz Hill. So we just have one, one aircraft at North Weald operating that covers Essex and the surrounding areas. So the number of actual aircraft movements has decreased enormously. That's what, that's what I had understood. And <laughs> having been told that, I had noticed that all the horrible uh, helicopters hadn't been going straight over my house all the time, so it must be true. So could you just explain, where's the, I mean, in High Beach, equally, it's horrible for the people who live there. Could you just explain briefly what the problem was for the city police, the helicopters, so that I get the story straight and I can then tell others. Thank you. Yes. Um, the problem with the city, um, with the aircraft or what the service in the city, was that quite often uh, the response times that the Met Police wanted weren't met. Um, and also, um, Northfield seems to have its own little. Um, weather kind of climate and uh, quite often um, the airfield was um, unusable due to low cloud base and, and mist and fog which meant the, the, the helicopters couldn't operate so 
Councillor Kane will back me up here. We had a meeting uh, when it was discussed that the helicopters were going back to Lippitz Hill with a senior officer at Scotland Yard, and he made it quite clear to us for operational reasons that the Met helicopters operating out of Northfield wasn't feasible to them, hence why they moved back. Thank you. Councillor Helen Kane. I just add to that, if, the, if I may, you may. that uh, the police uh, own a piece, the piece of land in uh, High Beach, so they have their own, you know, they do not use somebody else's. <laughs> just, uh, so they can do that, oh, you well, know. No, yeah. no, uh, the, uh, the, I have been to uh, Northwood uh, Airport many, many times. And I know that the um, air ambulance, for example, have been in the bank, things like that. Uh, but what, uh, what surprises me all the time uh, is the fact that, you know, people do uh, use, you know, speed. They do not uh, uh, put, you know, they do not uh, keep to the... The, the, the rules that uh, so I am wanted to ask you uh, I always wonder if there there have been a lot of accidents there because I'd be very surprised you know that they have if they haven't you'll be pleased to know and touch wood there haven't been many accidents at all Council Stephen Heather thank you chair uh, I've totally lost my plot now. I, I, I was actually going to just comment that I never liked Northfield as an airfield, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, one of the reasons being the fact that car users can drive across taxiways, runways, and any other way that they like. Uh, I can understand that the, the council wants to try and generate revenue, and by licensing this airfield, that would allow commercial flights, as you say. We've got Stapleford just down the road that is a licensed airfield, an aerodrome, and you have the Executive Aviation, I believe, if they're still operating out of there, and a flying school. Northfield, I understand, has still got a flying school, so it, it's, it's not, not earning revenue. Uh, and the other thing was that you'd actually considered spending a quarter of a million pounds on a VOR when there's one at Lambourne at the end of Stapleford's runway that can be used to go into Northfield. So it, to actually license this would cost more than it's actually worth, in my opinion. Just to confirm, the report recommendation is that we remain licensed. Um, so I totally agree with you in terms of the, um, the issue with the, the, the cars and uh, uh, aircraft on the taxiway. But as I said previously, we're doing what we can to mitigate that that problem uh, through various means and like I say the taken around 70% of the traffic off the, the the aircraft off the taxiway by implementing a new taxiway option will will help improve that Councillor Heath uh, thank you it's just uh, to correct Councillor Brady at no point did I suggest that flying should desist at North Wheel. I was just uh, talking about an increase in commercial traffic uh, if it's going to become a hub of highly skilled engineering and avionics, that's a different thing, and that's a good thing. But uh, not to stop flying at all. Thank you, Councillor Heap. Councillor Allgood? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm slightly confused in the sense that I've got here that there's to consider and comment on the recommendation uh, to remain um, unlicensed. Mm. You started by saying there's two options. We're going to be unlicensed or licensed. Is, un is licensed off the table, or are you still trying to go for it? I'm not, I'm not trying to go for licensing at this stage. Do you want to come back? Yeah, sorry. So in that case, if uh, a large number of improvements are made, the safety, et cetera, et cetera, which almost puts it on scale that it could be licensed, is that on the table? That would need looking at again, I agree. Councillor Bolton. I suppose as the district councillor for Northville, I ought to say something. <laughs> <laughs> to turn this into a mini standstill would be crazy and should not even be considered. Um, 
I used to sit in my back garden and watch the lovely um, air, air displays. They then moved to South End, and uh, South End has later produced a lovely commercial passenger airport, which people liked, but it's in financial trouble and it's likely, I understand, to close. So that you write off. Um, I support, and the village would support, the present use um, for helicopters, uh, provide the control, and light aircraft. My question mainly is, what is the plan for development of freight? Because there is a plan to develop sort of um, depots for commercial use. They would want access to the field. They would possibly increase the use of freight. What is the position of freight uh, transport by air into North Wales? Beat your microphone. Oh, sorry. I speak so slow. I take your point, Councillor. Um, I think what we would be trying to attract rather than freight, and, and I think it says that in the report, I would much prefer uh, aviation-related businesses, the engineering, the maintenance, and the avionics kind of business rather than, than what is in the report, to be quite honest. Well, Darren, I think you've answered most of their questions. I hope you've got some thoughts and points to take up. And thank you for your time. Um, this is the last meeting of the municipal year. Um, thank everybody for their support, especially Laura and Jenny. Um, hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. And I close the meeting at 8.11. <laughs>